Let's move on, though, into our next team, looking at the Texas A&M Aggies College Station and Jimbo Fisher taking over. We've already kind of looked at him already in a segment earlier this offseason, kind of expectations for Jimbo Fisher this year in College Station. But before we get into him, because I know we're going to talk about him in his first year, I actually have a quote for you, and I am getting this quote from the fan-cited um, Texas A&M uh, Texas site, gigumgazette.com. And they wrote an article, Jeff Schull is the guy's name, wrote an article where in it he said, in a comprehensive review of the SEC by Lindy Sports, one SEC coach spoke anonymous, anonymously, anonymously. Anonymously. <laughs> anonymously about the hire, and this is of their um, Jimbo Fisher and also their defensive coach, Mike it, it Elko. Was, it was more about Mike Elko. And when he says that, he goes, here's the exact quote. He knows what he can do, but I never thought Notre Dame played great defense. I watched the first half of AM and spring game, and I thought the defense sucked. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think about that, Coach? We don't know who said it, but that means somebody in the SEC, one of the coaches in the SEC, isn't thinking too highly of Texas A&M's defense coming into this year based off their spring game. Again, that's that's spring ball. I I, I think that what what you see in the spring, mm-hmm. yes, we there's some things that we can go off of, and there's some things that we can also be extremely troubled about and go, oh, that doesn't look good. But at the same time, it's a new coach. Mm-hmm. They're learning a new scheme, and I know that it's going to take some time both on the offensive and defensive sides. And culture. Mm-hmm. We, how many times do we talk about culture? You're trying to bring in a new culture and instill something new amongst these players. Get them to where, buy in and believe. Yes. I mean, I think the theme before, like when they'd leave the uh, the tunnel, it was mm-hmm. eight and eight is great. But um, I, 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 I think, like that one. I, I think That's that, Kevin Sublin. Um, I think that what they're going to see now mm-hmm. is a lot more practices that we're going to work harder. We're going to have to be bigger, faster, stronger, and that's going to come from working hard. And Jimbo Fisher, he only knows winning. Mm -hmm. So for a coach that only knows winning, he's going to bring in, I think, a winning mindset, hopefully, that will sweep across these players. So to get to that point again, is that it really, to that point, to the point that you asked, and I went about it a long way, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they if, if this one person mm-hmm. thought they sucked in spring ball. Well, here's the thing I want to kind of bring into it, though, is not necessarily like it doesn't matter that this one person thought like, oh, or this one coach, I should say, thought they sucked. But the the one thing that I mean, I think he made an OK point. I'm going to say OK, and I'm kind of being nice, maybe, is when he said he knows what he can do. But I never thought Notre Dame played great defense. To me, he's talking about 2016. Well, he ain't wrong. To me, that is what we can kind of take from. Not necessarily the spring game, because all right, this is he's coming in. This is the first time this coaching staff is kind of working with these kids, working with these college players. But I think that's a good point. Was Notre Dame defensively a great, stout defensively, like a defense team? Not necessarily, but the thing with Notre Dame was that more of Brian Kelly and everything going on with him as the head coach and not necessarily Mike Elko. So I'll ask you, we'll start defense. I know we usually like to start offense, but I'll ask you starting defense, what do you expect from the Texas A&M, A&M defense this year in 2018? I, I think that what they'll do, while there are questions – I think Mike Elko will be able to help them. He he took a Notre Dame defense that mm-hmm. was, let's be honest, god awful in 2016. I mean, you couldn't stop Duke. That was bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you were. I'm just remembering the game that I went to in 2016 that they they played against Duke. It was at home. Notre Dame was winning. Duke gets back into the. It was just bad. It was just bad. Um, but to this net to this past year, take them to be the 46th ranked defense. In the country, now people would still hear, "Well, forty-six. Well, you're not in the top five. That's not mm-hmm. very good." No, it's a lot better because they were 
I mean, I, I if someone would have told me that Notre Dame's defense in 2016 was dead last, I would have probably believed them. Mm-hmm. That's how bad they were. So to bring them back to be at 46, I, I think that in 2017 is big. So bringing in Mike Elko is only going to help your squad. I think that if they, again, this is another one where if you bring in a little bit more depth, if you add some depth depth to that defense, mm-hmm. I think you're going to feel a little bit more comfortable. But right now, having the defensive coordinator in place that you do is already going to be a big help for them. Well, and for me, you mentioned depth, and for me, the one position that I look at on this defense, defensive end. They don't have much depth at the defensive end. Pretty much it's, we've got Landis Durham, who's our senior end, and then it's like, all right, what else do we have on that pass rusher from the end? Because he had 10 and a half sacks last year. So I wonder what Elko will be able to do with this kind of the top guys. So like the Landis Durham's, the Tyrell Dotson's, the Derek Tucker's, what is he able to do with them? And can he find a way to use schemes to overcome the depth problems that this team might have? Because the one thing I didn't mention, this is the last thing I'll mention from that fan site article um, by Jeff Schull, is he kind of said the same thing that you said, where he said, and I quote, it's not fair to judge Elko's defense in a spring game in his first year as the coordinator. He's not going to go all out with schemes. He's not game planning to stop one offense. If you want to criticize his defense in previous stops, fine, but the start or but the stats wouldn't back up the claim. And that's really all that matters. So for me, it really comes down to with the defense, though, like I said, what can he get from those top guys? And with schemes and game plans, can he find a way to mask that depth and where we look at it and go, oh, we said that'd be a huge problem this year. And I guess it didn't really matter. So it all depends on if he's able to do that in 2018. Yeah, and I think that the interesting thing is that, yeah, the, the depth really isn't there for them. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the a lot of the starting positions, like you said, with— They've got their um, guys solidified. Yeah, like 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 you said, with Landis Durham, mm-hmm. I think you've got a, a, a really good guy there. Tyrell Dodson, Derek Tucker mm-hmm. at the safety position. Uh, both of them are expected to be guys on the rise who will be able to— come into their own in those positions and really be able to make some plays. There's there are some questions at certain points at certain parts of the secondary, like at cornerback and, and things like that, but there is talent on the defensive side of this roster. Mm-hmm. It's thin once you go past the starters, but there is talent at those starting positions. So it's one of those where you just hope that guys can stay healthy and you believe that if they can, you're able to make a run. Mm-hmm. That's where I think that Ole Miss, excuse me, uh, where te- we were just talking about, where uh, Texas A&M is right now. With these previews, right sometimes now. it's hard to disassociate that last <laughs> team from your head. Hell, I even did it in the Ole Miss one where I was talking about Arkansas stuff when we were in the Ole Miss segment. But, yeah, and the other thing, too, is with Jimbo, because Jimbo Fisher coming in, he's an offensive guy. So he's not going to be a guy that we're yet. Yeah, Florida State, his defenses were no joke. They were never elite in my mind. Really, the thing that we remember back to is the offenses and pretty much the quarterbacks for Jimbo Fisher. So he's going to need a guy like Elko to come in and kind of be that defensive mind while Jimbo Fisher worries about the offense. What do you think about the offense for Texas A&M coming into this year? I just want to say again Mm -hmm. really quickly that Texas A&M last season allowed at least – 35 points in six games mm-hmm. last year. Well, that's a cut. 35 points is that in because, six games. Is that going to change just because of the coaching staff, though? Was that a Kevin Sumlin thing? And not necessarily going to be a Jimbo Fisher thing? But what I wanted to say is that, again, mm-hmm. I want to make the comparison to Notre Dame because mm-hmm. that's where Elko's coming from. Yep. He did. 2016 was a horrid defensive year for mm-hmm. them. They they had a different coordinator, but then Elko comes in in 17, turns it around. Mm-hmm. Elko's now coming over here in 18 for a team that that struggled defensively at times, could turn it around. So I think that he's 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 got his work cut out for him. 
but I think that you can be really optimistic that you have the right guy to be able to turn that situation around. Mm -hmm. But yes, now to move over to the offensive side, what I think is going to be interesting here is a lot of people are going to expect a lot of really big things from Texas A&M already in year one because of the Jimbo Fisher effect. They're going to expect, we gave you 10 years and $75 million, Mm -hmm. you better be winning nine games year one. I think that's an unrealistic expectation. (laughs) And I'm not saying that they couldn't win nine games, but to think just because you got a guy who's getting paid 10 years and $75 million and he really never had a bad year at Florida State until last season, I, I still don't think that you can put that on a guy. I don't think that you can do that. Also, especially because he's going to be bringing in his own scheme, as almost every new head coach is going to do, Mm -hmm. and he's bringing in a pro-style scheme. He's bringing in a very up-tempo type of scheme, and what is it that we talked about last week, Ricky? It's that um, for Willie Taggart, his his game plan at Florida State is much more simple, Mm -hmm. whereas with... Jimbo Fisher, a little bit more there's complex. Some, it's complex. There's a lot in this playbook. So who's going to pick up the playbook the, the the quickest, the fastest, and that's going to take us to our quarterback competition between mm-hmm. Nick Starkle and Kellen Mond. And I think that the winner of this quarterback competition is going to be the guy that's able to grasp the playbook the fastest and who's going to understand it the best. And Starkle, he ends the season. He, he ended up with... Uh, over 1,400 yards, 11 TDs in his last four games. Kellen Mond also had some good moments throughout the year as well, and he's the guy who's going to be a better runner. So Jimbo Fisher has been a guy who knows how to work with quarterbacks. Jameis Winston, great quarterback. Mm -hmm. Great quarterback over at Florida State. And DeAndre Francois, a really good quarterback in his freshman season at Florida State as well under Jimbo Fisher. So what fans can be... I think excited and hopeful about is that whoever ends up being the starting quarterback in this system for Jimbo Fisher is going to be a good quarterback. Is going to understand the playbook. Is going to know the playbook, and they can feel like Jimbo Fisher picked this guy. All right, that's the right guy. Well, and the thing that I look at, and I'm kind of pulling up an article here, is both of them. This isn't really going to answer anything when it comes to the position battle which you're looking at our logo right now i looked up the camera has died on us brandon so we're basically audio for the whole rest of this segment for sure and the thing that i look at with both these guys nick starkle first is that when they were talking about the coaching staff this was from late may starkle says i love coach fisher he's brought a whole new intensity here a whole new mindset whereas you've got mod who came in and he said If we do something wrong, he's on us. If we do something right, he's on us. Because there's a better way to do stuff. He's trying to hold us accountable, trying to depend on us to lead the whole entire offense, the whole entire team. So it looks like from these two comments, Jimbo Fisher being very hands-on with these guys is only benefiting. And that's what Jimbo Fisher wants. Jimbo Fisher wants his quarterback And the thing I look to is basically what Mod said, is he wants us not to just lead the entire offense, but lead the entire team. The thing I want to go back to is, now, I might have hated him in college. I might not be his biggest fan, but Jameis Winston, who was a Jimbo Fisher quarterback. The one thing you cannot say about Jameis Winston is, is you cannot say, oh, that guy does not know how to fire up a football team. He does not know how to be a leader in the locker room. You can't say that because he can't. You can hate him for every off-the-field issue and uh, problem he had in college. You can hate him for how he's not winning with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers right now if you're a Buccaneer fan. But the thing you cannot hate him for is his leadership in the locker room, and that's what Jimbo Fisher wants. And to me, the... The one that's going to win this job, and that's why I can't say for sure if it's going to be Starkle, if it's going to be Mod, is which one of these guys 
takes command of the locker room. Which one of these guys is the leader on the field, leader in the locker room? Because that plus the talent is going to help Jimbo Fisher say, that's my guy. I think you're right. I think it's also going to be who who gels better with these receivers mm-hmm. that they have as well. And these receivers, they're looking for some big plays. And, and they have some big threats here at receivers. They've got Jamon Osbon, who had 50 catches last season. He averaged about 11.4 yards per catch. Kind of, you know, what's his ceiling? I don't think he's even hit that yet. Mm-hmm. He could possibly, let's see, even go to 14 yards a catch, 15 yards a catch this next year. Cameron Buckley, they're looking at him as possibly the you know a, a, a new deep threat as well. And then Jalen Preston, a four-star receiver that was very, very coveted in the Texas area, goes to Texas A&M. So they have some weapons there. And I think it's also, like I mentioned, going to be not only who's who understands the playbook the best, who has the best tools, who's the best leader, but who also gels the best with this group of wide receivers. Well, and the thing I also think, too, is just overall with this offense is this team has a really good, like, if I'm a Texas A&M fan, I should be optimistic for this year. Like, I know you mentioned earlier that you, you don't want expectations to be too high just because you have Jimbo Fisher, but I'm kind of looking at the schedule already, and to me, the thing I want to ask you is, is Texas A&M with Jimbo Fisher being a little bit too ambitious by scheduling Clemson second game of the year, 7 o'clock Eastern time, ESPN game? Are they being too ambitious by Jimbo Fisher first year, boom, we want Clemson, who was a college football playoff team, who's a national championship team and, under Dabo and was, Sweeney. Was that Jimbo Fisher who scheduled that game, or was that know, already scheduled I, on, the, on the— I don't know if that was already scheduled put on or the if schedule that was. I because, don't know if it was already because scheduled I think or if it was that Jimbo. They, I think that they schedule these games a couple of years mm-hmm. in advance. It's weird, though, because they have that scheduled, but then the next week, which is week 15, or September 15th, it says to be determined. They don't have an opponent that week. They still got to find someone— For that game. So I don't know if it was Jimbo. I don't know if it was before Jimbo. But the thing is, whether it was with Jimbo, whether it's not, I I think the question can still be asked then, is that too ambitious for this team to go after Clemson, either if it was after Jimbo and just because you have Jimbo, or if it was before Jimbo and you didn't even know you were going to have him as your head coach? So that's why I'm not going to answer the question of is it Mm -hmm. too ambitious, but is or what is can it, we expect is, from is that Texas game? A&M going to be ready right away week 2 to face what has been a, a pretty pretty consistent talented mm-hmm. team in Clemson. Now, last season Clemson was not what they had been because I, I think that they, well, they certainly felt the loss of not having Deshaun Watson, but even still they were competitive. Mhm. This is going to be, I think, a much more pe- competitive Texas A&M team with Jimbo Fisher there leading the guys at the helm, a, a defense that I think is has guys already in place but will get better with Elko there, an offense that I think is ready to possibly explode mm-hmm. in a good way, but will they be ready? I looked at a preview of that game, and I'm not sure if it was on Athlon Sports or Fan Sided, mm-hmm. but the preview it goes through and it says everything. But I was more interested to who they had winning the game. They had Clemson with 20 points. Mm-hmm. They had Texas A&M with 23, winning the I just, game. I just don't week see two it. against Clemson. I saw that score and my jaw dropped, mm-hmm. and I'm like, wow. Is Texas A&M going to be ready by then? But we have to remember, they have a pretty good offense. Defensively, that's the question. Do the guys step up and make the plays they should be making in the starter positions? I think they can. I think Elko has them ready at that point. I think it will be a close game. I I don't think we see a blowout from either side. I think we do see a close game like that. It could be a 23-20. I, I, I would flip a coin at this point. As to who wins it. Well, and the thing I'm kind of going in my head right now is, so bear with me a little bit. So 
two and four. All right, that's going to be three and four. And I think I got one more left here to kind of figure out. All right, four and four, I think, is what I'm looking at. So the thing also for that game, and this is why, first off, I think that's far off. I don't think it's going to be A, that close, B, wrong person winning. I think Clemson's going to dominate in that game. And the only reason why I say that is, yeah, it was a different Clemson team with um, with Kelly Bryant and not Deshaun Watson. That defense is good in Clemson. And this year, they've got, like, you looked at Todd McShay's way-too-early mock draft, a ton of guys littered in that mock draft from their defense. That This Clemson defense is going to come ready to play this year. Another thing I look at that game, these coaches know each other. I know that we're not going to talk about, oh, was it scheduled before or after Jimbo? Point is, Jimbo's there now. And Jimbo Dabo have played each other eight times since 2010. That was um, Jimbo Fisher's first year at uh, Florida State, whereas Dabo had been at Clemson for two years prior. They are an equal four and four against each other. And the last three years, three or four years, Dabo Sweeney has gotten the upper edge. Now, the big four wins for um, Jimbo Fisher came when he had Jameis Winston as his starting quarterback. And when they were going national title hunting, same thing for Dabo Sweeney with Deshaun Watson. So that's the thing that I think makes that game important as well, taking the two teams out of it. Those coaches know each other. They know what they're going to want to do, and they're going to kind of, Dabo's going to be able to know what Jimbo's going to do before he does it. Same thing for Jimbo and Dabo. So I kind of look at that game on the schedule, and I just think if they scheduled that after Jimbo or even before Jimbo, I feel like it's being a bit too ambitious for Texas A&M because if it was before you had Jimbo, you have no reason in my mind scheduling that game because of what you have been under Kevin Sumlin. I know you scheduled Josh Rosen in UCLA last year, but spoiler alert, Clemson is not Josh Rosen and UCLA of last year, and you lost that game after leading for most of it. So, I mean, that's the one thing I look at, but when I look at the rest of their schedule, they're primed to have another good year. I feel like, for me, the biggest question is, First off, this isn't a question. This is just a fact. You don't have to play Florida this year, so that's good. You don't have to play Florida, who was a close game last year, and really your biggest games are the ones that it is every year. What do you do at Alabama? What do you do at Auburn? What do you do at Mississippi State? What do you do at home against LSU? The bad thing against those, I'm sorry, the Alabama teams you're probably losing because you have to go into Alabama and into Auburn, but then Mississippi State is also a road game. So for me, it comes down to what are you going to do against those top four in your division of Alabama, Auburn, Mississippi State, and LSU? I'd be really interested to know who the TBD is going to be um, mm-hmm. in, in week three. We'll know for when them. they schedule that, it. That will be uh, very interesting because right now I think I've I've got them in at about seven wins mm-hmm. or so. Um, Let me it, and it could be, it could possibly be an eighth mm-hmm. with with them. Uh, but one of the other things I wanted to mention. Can I br- ask you something real quick? Sure. I want to put you into the shoes of Jimbo Fisher. You have now the role of scheduling that game. Do you go for a power five? Do you go for a non-power five? Or do you go for in, in the easiest opponent you could play? The Citadel. <laughs> Slotting them in. And if or they're not Chattanooga? available, I'm going Mercer. Oh, okay. No Chattanooga? No, I, I, I'm kidding. I, I, you know what? I, I think that if you can slot those, someone in those here. Those two are some classic SEC oh, they are. conference oh, games. Oh, they are. Especially for Alabama. The, the Alabama's playing the Citadel uh-huh. this year. Um, so Played Mercer last year. Yeah, I know. I know. It's just, who do we want to beat this season? <laughs> I, I think, though, for Texas A&M, you just played Clemson. You have Alabama the week after. Mm-hmm. Maybe you go with a mid major. Maybe you go with a mid major mm-hmm. there in the middle where you, if if you, I mean, maybe they already schedule and it's just not on here, but I would assume that they haven't yet. Mm-hmm. So if they still haven't, you try and go for somebody in the middle. Someone in the middle where hopefully, yeah, you'll beat them, but they're still a quality opponent. 
And I wonder if that game obviously wasn't scheduled when Jimbo Fisher came in, but if Jimbo's like, you know what, let me sit on it a little bit because you look at the two games you mentioned on the outside, do we really want to kind of uh, kind of work ourselves out where we are playing Clemson, another tough team? Oh, we do have it. I do have it. I looked up at um, 12thman.com. We do have that opponent. Someone's probably already shouted at us in the comment section. You want to know who it's going to be? We've mentioned them before on yeah. a uh, on a podcast or on a team this uh, week. Louisiana Monroe. So it'll be okay. Clemson, Louisiana Monroe, and then Alabama. So they went for the easy one. <laughs> they went for the easy one. I get it. It's going to be it. home at College Station, Kyle that, Field or Kyle Field. That that makes that makes sense. So mm-hmm. you you put another win there, and I and I. I think I've got eight. All right for for them right now, but this is this is a team where again I think that there is really great upside, but they need to fit. One of the things I wanted to mention was that they need to figure some things out with the offensive line, outside of the center position. Mm-hmm. I think right tackle, everything else is kind of up for grabs, mm-hmm. and they don't have necessarily a solid. A solid offensive line. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's been injuries, there's been inconsistencies, and that always is going to play into what your what your quarterback's able to do behind center, what your running back's able to do, and it's probably going to be junior running back uh, Travion Williams who will be leaned on this season. Can you open up holes for him to be able to run and create space and everything like that too? So while I think Texas A and M has a lot of promise, especially with the new head coach, the new scheme, and a new feel about them. Mm. There's still things that need to be improved upon. Yeah, I mean, just going through the schedule, really, for me, I'm going to go with six wins. You get a bowl game, seven wins, another seven and six season, and it's mainly because you'll go three and one in non-conference, then you'll beat Kentucky, South Carolina, Old Miss, that'll put you at six. Then your seventh will be your bowl game. The big thing for me, Alabama, Mississippi State, Auburn, LSU, what do you do in those four games? Do you steal one from any of those? I don't see it. Any final thoughts before we move on into Mississippi State? No, sir. Well, this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you think down below in the comment section about Jimbo coming in. You can check out. We kind of didn't talk about really the expectations in this one because it's going to be popping up for you guys on your screen. Um, We kind of looked at that already for Jimbo Fisher and his expectations. But let us know what you guys think about Texas A&M down below in the comment section. (laughs) 